welcome to Rare On Air, the new monthly podcast from Eurodis, Rare Diseases Europe. I am your host, Julian Poulan, and once a month we will be exploring the challenges, successes and experiences of those who live with a rare disease. In today's episode, and one year on from Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, I talk to a number of leaders who have led the response in supporting Ukrainians with a rare disease who have been affected by the war. I speak to Tetiana Kulesha. Tetiana is the board chair of the organization Orphan Diseases of Ukraine. Since the outbreak of the full-scale war in Ukraine, the organization has coordinated vital donations of medication and humanitarian aid. I am also joined by Kasia Shvetskovska and Adrian Goretsky. Kasia is an educator, co-founder and a principal of an educational center for children with special educational needs in Gdansk, Poland, and she is vice president of SONY, the Polish Association for Persons with Intellectual Disability. Adrian is a lawyer and patient advocate who has been leading the Healthcare Education Institute, a foundation providing care and therapy for people with rare diseases in Central Eastern Europe, teaching patient advocacy groups and healthcare professionals. From neighboring Poland, both Kasia and Adrian have been leading support for Ukrainians affected by the war. Finally, I am also joined by my colleague Anastasia Saliuk. Anastasia is the lead for Eurodis' response to the war in Ukraine. So, Tetiana of Orphan Diseases of Ukraine, if I may start with you, what was the initial impact of the Russian invasion on the rare disease community in Ukraine? How immediately did the war affect access to treatments, medical care and social support and things like that? Well, thank you for the question. I need to explain you that when the war started in Ukraine, all orphan disease patients had and have two wars. It is the first the war with the Russian occupied, and another war it is uh, fighting for their treatment. And we have a very big problem with our treatment in the first time in Ukraine because nobody knows what we need to do. And a lot of patients really were fighting and were scared. And they go abroad, they go, they go in Ukraine and in other regions. And only, I think, during two months, we can understand what we need to do in this house and what we need to help. And I must say that overall, this is a bigger part of our help to Ukrainian patients because on the first time, we didn't know when we need to take money, where we need to go our patients, where we need to buy treatment. And I want today say a big thank you all of you all for, for members of Euro or this in another European country who help our patients. And uh, I think it's very difficult to explain what we have situation in the start of the war on Ukraine or now, because a lot of patients stay in Ukraine. And only 30% of patients go abroad. And now we have uh, understanding what we need to do inside of our country and what we need to help of our patients to. Thank you for that, Tetiana. It's very kind of you to thank you, Rodis. Can you provide any quite personal examples of how any particular people were affected by the invasion? I uh, speak about my own son because my own son it has uh, the MPS, MPS 6, it is orphan diseases. And the first time when we go to the east part of Ukraine, our treatment stay in Kyiv. And during the first months, we haven't treatment because we haven't taken this uh, medicine from the Kyiv to another part of Ukraine. It was difficult because we have a bomb in Kyiv, you know, and a lot of hospitals didn't work on this time. And today I want to say thank you volunteers who take this treatment for one clinic of the Kiev and go into the east part of Ukraine. But during one month, we haven't treatment. And it's my own situation. And when I understand that I need help my son, I can help another patients for Ukrainian, we really stand in Ukraine and start to do it. We understand how we can do it. And later, my son did treatment for another patient. He drove by car and did this treatment for another region. Thank you for sharing that personal experience with your son, Tetiana. So during that immediate period of the crisis, what were the main actions and activities that your organization led to support Ukrainians with a rare disease? I, I want to say biggest word for my team uh, for my organization, because I think my organization, it is the best team in the world. 
because in the first of the war, more than 50% of my colleagues stay in Ukraine. Yes, it's really we uh, were scared and we go to another part of Ukraine and we stay in Ukraine. And after, I think, two weeks, we call it each other and understand that we need to do something for our patients. And today, uh, really, I'm proud that I have my colleagues. It's not, not, not only colleagues. Now it's friends. It's a big family, which understand it, what we need to do, what we need to help, how we need to help. And really, uh, maybe it's so unusual words, but I'm happy because I have my team, my family, and I have it in me. It's brilliant that you have such a great team. Anastasia, I'd like to turn to you now. What role has the wider rare disease community in Europe played in supporting Ukrainians living with a rare disease since the start of the invasion? So, unfortunately, I only joined the Eurodis team in April, so I cannot, you know, share my personal experience in the first months in the invasion. But I know from the stories shared by my colleagues that basically they started by contacting their network. And this is what helped the most. Um, Michael and other colleagues, they were a lot in touch with the patient organizations in Ukraine and trying to connect them with their European colleagues. They themselves were very much in touch with the European associations and the specific organizations. And back then, we all received a lot of individual requests. And answering to them helped us build more stable or durable mechanisms. So, for example, both Eurodis, the European Reference Network, they have given a lot of individual requests, with which we started to uh, cope somehow sporadically, but then this evolved into a virtual rare disease hub for Ukraine that first existed in Barcelona and now it's placed in Kiev. And that provided the structure, this administrative resource to receive these cases, to sort of triage, and then try to find a specialty center who would be able to receive such patients in Europe, but also in the places of internal relocation in Ukraine. In this, we also cooperated a lot with the European Commission and other agencies that work actively in this field. And having this huge network of patient organizations in every country in Europe helped a lot and all of them mobilized uh, significantly and were really, really supportive of Ukrainian patients. And of course, I guess, speaking about the neighboring countries, Ukraine is of utmost importance because they took the biggest load of uh, immigrants or temporarily displaced people. And of course, Poland was probably one of the hotspots and still is a hotspot for Ukrainians uh, in general, and Ukrainians living with rare disease in particular. And already in June, we started a project called Razem z Ukraina, or Razem z Ukraina, it's almost the same in Ukrainian and Polish symbolically, to help Ukrainian patients and it's an association of almost 15 organizations now in Poland will support Ukrainian patients uh, even today. Thanks, Nastasia. And of course, the Rare Disease Hub has been a really great initiative. Of course, while Tatiana mentioned that most Ukrainians living with the rare disease stayed in the country, many did have to flee. And as mentioned by Anastasia, many Ukrainians living with the rare disease fled to Poland in particular, which leads nicely onto my next question for Adrian. Adrian, what compelled you and your organisation to begin supporting Ukrainians who'd fled? And what response did you pull together at the start of the invasion? Well, it was the right, right thing to do that. There was, was no other option where Russia started a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. We decided that we need to act. I can speak of myself, but also many of my colleagues in other geographic areas. In fact, I am not uh, I am not a single disease for patient advocate right now. I used to, for years, I was president of the Polish Association for Primary Immune Deficiencies. But, well, for three years at my own foundation, we were doing different stuff for the world. We were doing most legal uh, things and some trainings for patient advocates. But we decided that we need to shift our activity totally. Yes. This was the first day of the invasion that we thought, yes, we need to sleep. We need to put those projects on hold and go back go to the you know, ground level and help those people and use those contacts that we had for many, many years. I mean, me and my team, of course. And, uh, well, this was just the right thing to do. Even before the war, we were sending messages uh, to a couple of days before as the Russian forces were grouping at the Ukrainian border. Uh, we send messages to all patient advocates that we personally that if something really happens that our home is, is their home 
Well, it was the only right thing to do. Yes, in Poland, we do understand that Russia is a like, the greatest threat to Europe, and uh, it wasn't a problem for us to understand the severity of the situation. And uh, well, we started working with our Ukrainian uh, friends, with with associations, with uh, physicians, asking from the very first day, or what do they need? The first patient that we moved was on the twenty seventh February, so three days after the Spanish invasion started. It was a girl for um, qualified for bone marrow transplantation in Kiev, but the hospital was by a fire, so they they couldn't do it in Kiev. In couple, they have it scheduled for a couple. Well, days after war started, so they have been moved by us to to the city of Bydgoszcz, even before there were any formal procedures for this. Also, I can say that we cooperated, we have cooperated with Eurotis since the very beginning of the invasion. I can remember my calls with Michael at 11.30 p.m., yes, for a couple of days after the invasion started, we were trying to, to set up some, some system to, to help those patients, yes. So we started from the very beginning, and not only us, but so many others. Adrian, you've described an impressively immediate response from your organisation. Tasha, what compelled your organisation to act, and how did your organisation respond? So uh, my answer will probably be a bit similar to what Adrian has said. It was pretty obvious for us as uh, for a parental organization that if we were in the similar situation, uh, someone would do that for us. Okay, And we were sure that the Ukrainians would do the same for the Polish people. We know a lot of Ukrainians. We have friends in Ukraine. We have relatives in Ukraine. Um, a year before the, the war started, I had workshops for the Ukrainian Academy of Childhood Disability. And I met a lot of people there. So when the war started, I just wanted to make sure that they're, they are okay, that they are safe. And of course, offer them a shelter here in Poland. We also, because we are a national organization and we have branches in 120 places in Poland, and some of them are located very close to the Polish-Ukrainian border. And they immediately started informing us that there are huge groups of uh, Ukrainians uh, entering Poland. And they among them, there are people with uh, disabilities. So there is uh, these disabilities, and they uh, they need help. So there was Sony branches close to the border. They had no enough space, not enough cars, not enough equipment to support these people. So they um, contacted all the branches in Poland and asked for help. So immediately, Sony representatives from different uh, cities offered their cars and also accommodation. So the first days were mostly about going to the border, picking the people and driving them to a safe place and finding accommodation for them. Some uh, families were very uh, tired. So we also, it was very also important to find accommodation close to the border and give them like a day or two to have a rest. I remember the phone calls from Lublin, for example, when I asked my friends, okay, could you put the people on the train and I will pick them in Gdańsk? And they said, no, we'll let them go uh, in two days time when they get rested and when they feel stronger, when we feed them, keep them warm for, for two days, uh, etc. The first days were really very, very difficult. But one of the first things we did was like sharing what can we do as a national organization for the refugees. So who we collected information like who has equipment, who has cars, uh, who has accommodation and stuff like that. And this is what we started with. So the, the, the first and most important thing was safety, security and the basic and the basic needs. And then in the next steps, we started to think about therapies, treatment, etc. Thanks, Kasia. You've outlined very hands-on and comprehensive support that your organisation has led. Tetiana, of course, it's been 12 months since the full-scale invasion of Ukraine began. Over that period, have the challenges facing Ukraine's rare disease population changed? And if so, how has the response supporting Ukrainians living with the rare disease had to change? I think it's difficult uh, questions, but I want to say that uh, people who had treatment in Ukraine, a lot of these our patients stay in Ukraine. Because now the Ministry of the Health of Ukraine bought uh, for a lot of the people treatment. And our people who stay in the regions which didn't occup occupy it by Russia, they really stay in Ukraine. 
Yes, it's not safe all the part of Ukraine because all the time we have the bombed uh, from Russia and all the time we need to go to the shelter. But a lot of uh, patients stay. That patients who really didn't have treatment in Ukraine or that patients which were in the regions which occupied by Russia, they really go abroad and they really had treatment on abroad on another country. And my colleagues today speak a lot of their help to our patients and I won't say it one and one more thank you thank you all of you thank you all people who helping our patients and uh, now uh, I think that people who won't stay in Ukraine they really stay and people who uh, want to go abroad they go abroad and uh, take their treatment I believe that after the finish of the war when the Ukrainian victory all the our patients orphan disease came back to Ukrainian and will treat will have treatment in our I believe in it and believe I do everything that in Ukrainian now we are preparing all questions for them. I see. Thank you, Tatiana. Anastasia, through the lens of the work and research of Eurodis, how do you understand the situation for Ukraine's rare disease community to have changed since the start of the war? Well, when I try to look at a sort of bigger picture, I see that the needs evolved a lot over this year. And there are some things that are still there. But I would say in the first months, everybody was preoccupied with doing evacuations when needed, in bringing humanitarian emergency supply into the country. Then sometime in some, the situation is somehow stabilized and we started looking for more durable, available solutions. If we speak about, for example, the European countries, that was mostly about finding longer term rents or finding financial support for people and, you know, making their basic needs met. Same in Ukraine for internally displaced people and, you know, trying to find more stable mechanisms of support for that. And then, for example, already in October, a new challenge appeared with all the power outages in Ukraine, the topic of generators and power stations, how to import them, especially for the hospitals, patients who use at home oxygen concentrators or other devices that are connected to the electricity, became our new priority for other organizations. And so you can see that the needs evolve really fast, but what remains unchangeable is that the needs are still high. As they were high in the first months, they're equally high now. They might change, but support is still needed. And probably this is one of urgent messages that we are always trying to pass on to our interlocutors. Indeed, it's really important for that support to be maintained. Adrian, how do you expect your organization's response to change over the coming months? I can only echo what Anastasia just said, but I would just like to go back for a second what uh, Tatiana said. I mean that we also did a survey among our patients, not only we did it, uh, the, the patients that we take care of, and the overwhelming majority would like to go back to Ukraine after the war is over. The majority, really. And this is something we should admire. They would like to go back to their home. So now our responsibility as all Europeans, I believe, is to make sure that they will get the same level of treatment right after the war is over. So not only when it comes to reimbursement, but also when it comes to, to access to medicines. This is this is a big responsibility of the of both NGOs, but also the industry to be sure that uh, this treatment is provided maybe on some so on, on some other commercial rules that for other countries because of the war, because of the situation, but it's also our responsibility to make sure that the treatment will be available for those patients who would like to go back to their homeland after the war is over. When it comes to our activity, of course, it's changed too. There are many power stations in our office is currently because they have been just delivered and they will be sent to Ukraine shortly. Uh, but we also, we still keep sending humanitarian aid uh, to Ukrainian hospitals. We also started, because of the blackouts, a lot of patients uh, with immune deficiencies have been switched from hospital uh, treatment to home treatment. And now we are getting donations. We are, we are collecting donations and buying or getting donations of pumps, I mean, infusion pumps, and we are sending those infusion pumps to hospitals in order to provide it to the patients that they can do the infusion at home is because hospitals have problems with electricity. So also we don't have that, that much new patient coming uh, to our foundation, couple of patients a month, couple of cases, uh, new cases a month, not 20 like the beginning. Nah, but still we still do help them if somebody needs a treatment, don't have treatment in Ukraine, as uh, Tatiana said, they're coming to Poland and we provide them with treatment. There are procedures now, so maybe it's a bit easy, but on the other hand, there's also something which is called war fatigue 
week, yes. But again, I can only echo what Anastasia said. The amount of work is the same, just the vector is different, but we are still very busy. That's a really interesting way of putting it. Thanks, Adrian. Kasia, have you found the the changes to be similar in Poland uh, through the lens of your organization? Yes, it is a bit different now. Uh, First of all, my organization uh, works with uh, Eurodis, but also other uh, international uh, organizations. For example, with the help of the European Academy of Childhood Disability, we were able to deliver equipment for people with uh, disability in Poland, but also uh, in Ukraine and uh, Moldova. Uh, We had equipment from Sweden, for example, example, a huge transport of equipment twice or three times as long as I remember. We also cooperate with European Disability Forum and with this organization, we try to support uh, children with disabilities in institutional foster care. And uh, this is probably the biggest worry for us. If this group of children gets uh, proper treatment and proper, proper therapy. So this is a very important part of our work. We also work together with UNICEF and support the refugees with disabilities financially, but also with different uh, different therapies. What we can observe now is that the most urgent issues like the national identity number or the disability uh, status has uh, has already been solved. I mean, most of uh, the Ukrainians have the identity number and the disability status, though there are still single cases, like one case a week, one case uh, per two weeks, uh, where we have to help with, uh, with that. But Generally, it is about, you know, going on living here. As long as treatment and therapy is concerned, the treatment and the therapies in some cases are a bit different than the ones in Ukraine. So this was also a very important issue because we had to learn how to trust each other. And it was very challenging, for example, for Ukrainian parents to trust the the Polish doctors and the Polish therapists who offered different ways of treatment and different ways of therapy than the ones they knew in Ukraine. I also see that there are more and more requests for some inclusive activities because uh, we can observe that Ukrainians usually live in small Ukrainian communities, but they started learning Polish and they want to be involved in the local community's activities. They become more and more active. People also started looking for work, so they also need support. But as when we talk about children or people with rare diseases, these are mostly mothers and children who would rather not work. So we also have to make sure that they uh, are financially secure. So these are different. These are not urgent situations like we had in the beginning of the war. We don't have to work days and nights and so on because some things, I mean, it is not that important if you do it today or tomorrow. In the very, very beginning of the war, you had to do th- you had to do things, you know, immediately because people were waiting on the board and you had to get up and go and pick the people from the, from the board. Now... Uh, We can do it a bit slower in a more, let's say, easy way. But still, I do agree with Adrian that the work that we have to do, it's still a lot. Kasia, thank you for outlining quite a number of very specific changes in the challenge and response. Of course, the future of the war is very uncertain. But I'd like to turn to the question of whether there are any new challenges for Ukrainians living with a rare disease that we are expecting or anticipating. With regard to Ukrainians living with a rare disease in Poland, of course, most do want to return to Ukraine, as has been mentioned. Um, And so I'd like to ask you, Adrian and Kasia, whether you expect new challenges for Ukrainians living with a rare disease in Poland. Kasia, I'll let you answer first. I think Poland itself has a lot to do in the field of rare diseases. Our health system is not something that uh, we could be very proud of. And it takes a lot of time and a lot of uh, parents' uh, effort to treat children with rare diseases. So now, as the numbers have increased, because we have more patients and more parents, yes, because of um, the Ukrainian refugees, I think that there will be a lot of various challenges for uh, for, for the system and, uh, and for the families as well. And the families I talk to, a lot of them plan to stay in Poland. So I know that they will uh, stay here like permanently. So we really need to look for for solutions because just as I said, yes, the population has gone up. So we have to support all these people. At the moment, I think we get a lot of support from various international organizations. And it is great because thanks to that, for example, we can cover the costs of the therapies and treatment for for the refugees. But um, I expect that this support will not come here 
here forever. So we have to find some solutions inside Poland to prevent, you know, the challenges uh, or to prevent the difficult situations that we may fa- we may face uh, in the future. Indeed, it's really important for that support to be maintained. Adrian, how do you expect your organization's response to change over the coming months? Well, I start to what you said in the very beginning of the first question that the fate of the world is uncertain. I don't agree. I think that I'm sure that Ukraine will win, maybe this year, maybe next year. This year or next year will it take uh, Donbass and Crimea because the evil must be defeated and period. And when it comes to situation, we will support Ukrainian patients as long as it's needed. As I said, most of them would like to go back. There are exceptions. Most people from Donbass, uh, for example, lost their houses because also we got patients with stories like this. They would like to stay in Poland because they have nothing to go back to, yes, and if they have a job or things like this. I also would like to underline that the overwhelming majority of patients and their families found, found a job in Poland. They are working here, so they started to be our guests, and now they are a part of the society. Side, yes, but still they would like to go back. But of course, we will support Ukrainian patients as long as it's needed. And uh, then we need to think about long-term solutions, as I said before. Per- perhaps our job will not change until the end of the war, because now the situation is stable. We are helping families with the status of disability, as Kasia said, with some legal other legal issues. But uh, generally speaking, they found themselves in society right now. And they are working, they are educating themselves. And well, this is also something remarkable. Yes, after this initial shock and a lot of stories of people who are coming to Poland and fleeing from Donbass, for example, being shot at by the Russian barbarians. And now they are in Poland, they are safe, they are starting trying to, to, to start a new life, but still dreaming about coming back to Ukraine. So as they are dreaming about coming back to Ukraine, so our responsibility as West is not only providing Ukrainians with humanitarian and aid and weapons, but also to provide them with treatment after it. So this is, again, my huge appeal to anybody from the industry who is uh, listening to this podcast to think about how they can support Ukrainian patients that would, that would like to go back to Ukraine, yes, maybe with compassionate issues with other mechanisms, but this is something we all need to think about after the war is over, because they, more, lots of the patients will go back to Ukraine, but to the cities which are destroyed for it. So when it comes to my perspective and my organization, we'll do the thing that we are doing uh, right now. But we are too small to change the policy, we are too small to change the way of thinking of, for example, uh, industry. Absolutely. I think that wider perspective is really important. Tatiana, despite the many and immense challenges imposed by the invasion, I understand that your organization has rather impressively chosen not to change its ambitions from before the war with regard to making sure Ukraine reaches certain goals in Red Disease policy. What resulted in that decision? Right, because in our uh, policy, uh, policy question doesn't change it because we do it after the war and we do it uh, during the war and I think we will do it after, after our victory. But... Um, I don't know what we can do more in Ukrainian because now my organization and my colleagues, we connect with all main people in Ukrainian. We connect with the deputies, we connect with the Ministry of the Health, we connect the, uh, connecting with the Prime Ministry. And I don't know what we can do more uh, in connecting with our parliament or connecting with our official people. But I think we need... Um, work more of the rights of our patients. Maybe we need to work more with the regions of Ukraine because you know that a lot of regions in Ukraine now destroyed and we haven't enough of clinics and without we have it enough of doctors. And I think we need to work on this way and we will speak with the Ministry of the Health that we need to advise chance for our doctors that they have a more understanding what we need to do with our people, with our uh, patients. Maybe, maybe, in the future it will be. It's really brilliant the work your organisation is doing, Tatiana. Now, to conclude, I'd like to ask each of you what your message to the world would be with regard to Ukrainians living with a rare disease and the situation they are currently in. Let's say, for instance, that each of you had a minute to address people or policymakers on, let's say, TV stations across the world. What would your message be? Adrian, let's start with you. Well, my appeal will be to uh, see the situation from a broader perspective, not only the perspective of, of the inevitable military win of Ukraine, but also 
perspective of what is after the war and uh, we can talk about reconstruction of Ukraine. It's obvious. And I'm sure that the European Union will help, but we need to also think about the communities which are often overlooked, like patients with rare diseases, what's with them, what we can do for them. And if Euro European Union, if, and I'm sure that Ukraine will join the European Union. So it's also an investment of the European Union of common security of patients with rare diseases. So we need to see the big picture. Our organization received a lot of substantial support from many ways, also from Eurotis, thanks to Eurotis and the Erasmus Ukrainian project. We have an Ukrainian speaking employee, and she's doing a really good job helping those patients, taking care of these cases. Yes, but as I said, we are perhaps not uh, so powerful enough to change the situation. But, well, we still need powerful allies. And I believe we represent a community which is overlooked. Yes, so we need to do everything, not only to be present as Tatiana is doing, doing a great job in Ukraine, but also we need to be present at the European level and speak about Ukraine and Ukrainian patients. And Kasia, what would your message be? The message to the world, this is quite a challenge. Well, I think that... I think that everyone should be aware that this war does not only have uh, impact on Ukraine, it has impact on uh, each of us. And especially the, the countries that, <clears throat> that are close to Ukraine and support the refugees. Of course, we are really honored and we are happy that we are able to help and to support. But on the other hand, we are also parents and we know what parents want for their children. We want a safe, and peaceful world. And I'm sure that the Ukrainian parents want the same for their children. So the most important thing is to, is to finish this, this war. We all have to be aware that the war always has the strongest impact on the weakest ones. So uh, the ones with disabilities and rare diseases and other diseases. So these are the people that are at the most threat. So we really have to take responsibility for, for each other. We really have to be together. Just as Adrian said, I also believe that Ukraine will become a part of the Ukrainian, of the uh, European Union soon. And even if it's not a part of the EU now, these are still our friends and uh, these are still people that we really care for. So please don't forget, because I know that we easily get used to situations like this when it takes more than one year or two years or three years, people get used to it. You can't get used to the war. You have to remember that this is wrong and we have to end it. And we want Ukrainians to live in a safe and peaceful country. Absolutely, Kasia. And of course, it's really important that people don't just get used to the war. Tetiana, if you had a message for the wider world and the support that was needed for Ukrainians living with the rare disease, both inside the country and those who had to flee, what would that message be? First of all, never believe Russia. Second, maybe I want that all people understand in European countries that Ukrainian now it, it is shield for all European people. Really, sometimes it's we are, uh, it's really very difficult to explain people what now we have in Ukraine. If I can now speak in English more, I speak to you about my husband, which on the 1st of the February stay in Ukrainian Forces Army. And I know it's a terrible situation which our soldiers now do in our borders with Russia. And I want to say all people, please never again not repeat it. Not repeat it because it's a really very, very strange. It's very scary. It's uh, really, we all, the, uh, we all the parents of the children. And now we speak today about it. I don't know what I can more for my family, for my child, what I can more do for my country. It's really very scary. It's really very difficult. It's very blooded path. Never, please again, never. Thank you for that, Tatiana, and thank you and well done for all the amazing work that your organisation has done. Of course, your main message is really important, that this situation is fundamentally reprehensible. You've all joined me today to share your niche expertise and great work with regard to supporting Ukrainians with a rare disease. And we've talked about the individual responses and policies that have been enacted in this area. But of course, we all address that the fundamental problem remains the atrocious and baseless invasion of Ukraine itself.
Tatiana, Kasia, Adrian, and Anastasia, thank you so much for joining me today. It was a pleasure. Slava Ukraine. You have been listening to Rare On Air, a Eurodis Rare Diseases Europe podcast with me, Julian Poulan. Thank you for joining us. Don't forget to subscribe so you can tune in next month to learn more about the world of rare diseases. Do you have any reflections from today's episode that you would like to share? Feel free to email us at rareonair at eurodis.org. We look forward to you joining us next month.